Parental discretion is advised. Find yourself in the Beachview area of Pittsburgh? Check out the official pizza of this show, Slice on Broadway, sharing an abnormal obsession with pizza we can relate to. Check them out at sliceonbroadway.com and tell them this show sent you. Wait, just wait. Hey guys, it's the Wrestling Mayhem Show, episode 496. So, so very close. And uh, we're coming at you from the Mayhem Studios in Pittsburgh, PA. I'm Mike Sorg, at Sorgatron on the Twitters. And this is the show where we talk the big time professional wrestling and have a lot of fun doing it uh, for a while, though, according to that number. Uh, with me, uh, first of all, from the Lunchbox Hall of Justice, it is uh, your Papa Lunchbox. Hi, Sorg. Uh, have you secured the rights to Adele's new song for me? Hello, have you done that? No, no, no I'm not. I'm not aware of this. Oh, well, my intro is fucked. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Also with us, representing San Antonio, Texas, he is the voice of Inspire Pro Wrestling down there. Uh, it is Eamon Payton at Eamon Two Please on the tweeters. I, I'm doing fantastic. I was gonna. I was going to chime in on that uh, that uh, comment from Lunchbox, but then I realized I was just about to sing Lionel Richie's "Hello," and that's not what, <laughs> that's not the same thing. Not the right one. No, no, no. It is how an does adequate Eamon, substitute. How does Eamon reference Lionel Richie and LB references Adele? Everything is swapped. <laughs> Nobody knows how old they actually are. There he is, right here on the couch in the Mayhem Studios. Oh, representing yes. Mad Mike is mm. in town from normally Poughkeepsie, New York. I, I am representing New York, Pennsylvania, and I guess technically New Jersey since I had to drive through it. But I am here, Sorg. And we're getting a note from our community manager, uh, Missy, wife of the show. Uh, there is a line to my admin things that I do. LB Adele is above my pay grade. Uh, fair enough. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And also returning to the show, a longtime friend of the show. He is the man who... who Interviewed Virgil in his living room for the Legend of Virgil in his traveling table. He he dared to investigate the Montreal screw job with the Montreal theory, and we'll get into a little bit of the, the other things. He's the voice of the International Wrestling Cartel here in Pittsburgh. He is Joe Dombrowski. Thank you for that elongated introduction. Uh, I do not have a musical theme to my intro because if I did, I would start singing Girls in Cars from the File Driver album and it would all be downhill from there. Ooh, did you see that Zima was looking to uh, do remixes of old wrestling songs? I immediately texted him and told <laughs> him that if there is not something from Pile Driver or the fabulous Rougeau theme, mm -hmm. I would be very disappointed. <laughs> I was just about to say, I want Shima or Zima and uh, Facade doing All American Boys. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> I, no, I, no, that's what I want. Okay, we okay. need to make that happen. Go message him. Go message him. I will. I, I will. He's tweet taking him right requests now. on Facebook right now. Uh, so this, is, like I said, is Wrestling Mayhem Show. You can check us out. We're over at WrestlingMayhemShow.com. You can go there to subscribe to the show on video and audio formats. Thanks to whoever dropped a, uh, a rating uh, this past week. It was only a star rating, and that's okay. You can go there. Just click the star on the iTunes ratings for Wrestling Mayhem Show. It is going to help people find us, and we really do appreciate it and also please share the show and you can also uh drop us a line at 412-206-WMS0 or that email address good times good times uh, it's good times at wrestlingmayhemshow.com and uh follow us on the social medias at mayhem show on the twitters on facebook or the facebook group and uh, kind of sort of on the google plus as well uh and also, uh, big thanks to our friend Basic Sickness for that intro music. Uh, check them out at basicsickness.com. And big thanks to our friends uh, over at Patreon. Patreon.com slash Wrestling Mayhem Show supporting the show. And I don't know how to spell Patreon. Uh, but anyways, <laughs> first of all, big thanks to our friend Bo Diggity. Woo! Woo! Who pays us on Patreon so we can say his name like that every week for him to hear. And also, big thanks to our uh, the Matthew and Jennifer Carlin Foundation for Podcast Betterment. Uh, uh, WrestlingRevolution.com. TheWrestlingRevolution.com. Our boy, 
uh, Garza 2 k from over there, and Ed Burke, who uh, communicates with us a lot on the tweeters as well. Ed Burke 37. Ed Burke 37 on the Twitter. Thank you so now. much for supporting the show. And uh, you can do so too on patreon.com slash wrestling mayhem show, or please just share the show. Just tell your friends, hey guys, I think this is keen. You should check it out too. Keen. 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 Yeah, it's super keen. Okay. Like it. Super keen. Great, great, great word choice, Dork. <laughs> uh, but hey, yeah, hey Joe, we got Joe Dabrowski with us here. And Joe does things. I mentioned uh, a slight fraction of the things you're involved in, Joe. I'm uh, a thing doer from way back. You are a thing doer. Uh, uh, outsource announcing. You're doing uh, commentary, of course, with uh, Shane Douglas and uh, um, uh, one friend, a uh, former WWE announcer. He's, he's in in the fold with you as well, right? Uh, Jack Corpella is one of the options. Yeah, I can call any show, uh, any demo, whatever you guys uh, need done. If you're a potential promoter and uh, you want a professional feel for what you do uh, as far as your DVDs, your live events, your digital streams, whatever the case may be. If you are a wrestler and you are sending out a demo tape and you well, tape a demo disc or a demo <laughs> file and you want the recipient to hear you in a professional and positive light. Uh, if you need copy read on a video package, whatever the case is, I can do it all from home. You don't have to pay trans costs. Uh, I can do it at 4 a.m. from this here office and not have to leave my house. Everybody wins. It's affordable. And uh, I've been doing a lot of work lately with Big Time Wrestling, who, which has been doing national touring, and uh, also the Wrestling's Bloodiest War series uh, every week, every month, wow. excuse me, on uh, terrestrial pay per view. And a few other odds and ends here and there. And uh, all the information is at joe-dombrowski.com. Uh, I can do it solo. I can do it with uh, the franchise, Shane Douglas, Jack Propella, Benjamin C. Steele, uh, my regular IWC commentary uh, 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 partner in crime, Jay Worthington Farnsworth. Or, uh, hey, who knows? We'll make somebody up. We'll just uh, uh, drag somebody out of the dolder room here, too, whatever you want. So uh, that's just one of, of, of many dozens of things. That right, I right. I mean, and as we were talking about before the show, uh, you know, our friends here, you know, Mike here in the studio and a bunch of other people do the midweek war talking about what's going on. Basically, the secondary wrestling as far as uh, the guys not WWE at this point. And, and of course, there was some big news this past week with Ring of Honor. Mike, can you fill us in on what that is? Uh, yeah, basically, it looks like uh, in the beginning of uh, December, Ring of Honor is going to be changing networks from Destination America to... Um, was it Comet? Comet, Comet. Now, yeah. now are they? St they're still going to be syndicated on Seclair channels, right? Like, I'm still going to see them on my Pittsburgh TV. Yeah, or whatever? I think I think Comet's also like a subsidiary of Sinclair, which right, right. I don't know if I have it in New York. Um, I've heard rumors that I might, so I I'll have to check that check that when I get home. But I, I kind of really liked having it on Destination America. I was able to watch it properly. Mm -hmm. Um, because as, as you know, I don't really like using the internets to watch my wrestling like if i don't have to and, and comet is a sci-fi network and i from what i understand it, it's one of those if, if anybody has over the air antenna like the rtvs the retro tvs the if tv or if no this mm -hmm. wrong wrong single word apparently mm -hmm. um like there are those secondary channels like the uh, uh, uh channel 2.2 or something like that right um, and apparently I need to rescan my channels because apparently this is the secondary channel to our mm -hmm. My Pittsburgh channel locally. Um, so I get a sci-fi channel I didn't know about for free, right? Uh, so which is which I thought was like a little weird at first, but and, and look, there's the uh, cover of it, sci-fi. It's in our DNA. Uh, is, is there a thing? Oh, they have Stargate. It's just like when SmackDown oh, came on oh. sci-fi at first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which really, it, it does kind of seem like it, doesn't it, Leviathan? Uh, so... I say another move again. They're they're owned by Sinclair, so the the, the move absolutely makes sense. Um, the Destination America Wrestling Experiment doesn't seem like it's been working out for a lot of people. Uh, so, uh, but but I was wondering, you know, Joe, you you as we we've kind of teased, uh, have kind of set a, a, a few toes into uh, a, a lot of the major players here. Uh, most recently, uh, between Ring of Honor, TNA, and uh, Global Force Wrestling, according to your LinkedIn. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I was wondering what, what your take is on, on everything, kind of seeing it from uh, your side, I, you know, actually kind of working with these guys. I, I think when a lot of us fans look at these, like we look at like kind of where they are and seeing all the channel moves and we kind of think is morale has to be low or we hear the dirt sheets or whatever. Like what, what's the feel that you're getting out of these uh, as much as you can tell us, of course. Uh, 
I heard I've heard plenty of reports of, of low morale. Um, I can speak on the fact that when I was uh, at TNA in September, uh, when they had their house show down at the Ross River Ice Gardens, it was a very positive atmosphere. It was a, a very welcoming atmosphere. Other than guys being a bit fatigued from being at the end of a three-day loop on the road, um, everything was pretty upbeat. Everybody was happy to be there. Everybody was ready to go to work. Um, I got no signs of bad morale from TNA whatsoever. Uh, you know, could things be better there? Absolutely. But the talent um, are going to do their thing. And, and there's a great camaraderie among that locker room and a great uh, 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 sameness as far as their goals, as far as presenting the best show they can. Ring of Honor is, is just as much, if not more so, uh, because Ring of Honor is one of the few companies you can look at that is showing tangible growth. Uh, you know, television ratings and live event attendance and their visibility um, and the fact they've been able to, to, to lock down a number of guys under exclusive contracts. Uh, I, I really like that Ring of Honor is not trying to, you know, run before they can walk. They're not taking a huge leap that is going to be a, a sink or swim like if they were on FX or if they were on you know, the CW network or anything like that, where they would need to, to, to put all their eggs in that basket. Um, I was a big fan of the Destination America experiment because there was no way for Ring of Honor to lose. It was a very calculated risk. Uh, and, and some people have their opinions on, on, you know, could the show have been lit better? Could the show have been whatever? And th those are valid in a lot of cases, but Ring of Honor got exposed to uh, uh, millions of more potential homes, uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of more potential viewers than they would have gotten just in syndication. And it, from what I understand, it cost them a dime. Hmm. So that is nothing positive, whether it was a six month relationship or a six year relationship. Uh, Comet is going to be tougher to find, but uh, with that, that Sinclair uh, similarity, Ring of Honor is going to be more of a priority there. There may be more chance for growth within that individual microcosm. And you're still going to have the syndication and they're still going to look for, for, for more uh, uh, domestically and internationally, I'm sure. Uh, I watched the show in syndication on the local Fox affiliate and uh, what used to be my Pittsburgh TV, which is now the point. Um, so, so to me, it doesn't change. Uh, hopefully the people that were able to sample on Destination America will seek out Ring of Honor and keep following it, uh, uh, or maybe buy a pay-per-view, uh, uh, buy a DVD, whatever the case is. If not, then there's no harm done. But uh, I like the slow and steady growth of Ring of Honor a lot um, because they're able to make those calculated decisions and make sure that even if they have to take a half a step back, they're still going to be able to move forward with what they need to do. I think that's the other thing to think about with Ring of Honor, where people are like, "Oh, there's only 600 people at this show. Oh, they're only doing this. Oh, there's only, you know, they're 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 not making crazy buys on on pay per view. Oh, they're only on my Sinclair channel. Um, they're also not dumping a lot of money into it. Like if you go to a show, you notice, I can kind of, I I don't mean to, you know, kind of blast them on this, but it feels only slightly above an indie show at a certain point, right? It's not the full on crazy production of even what I've seen at a TNA show. Right, and that's not necessarily a bad. No, thing. no, it isn't. I, I think they're 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 working on a certain level. Therefore, any advances they make, uh, and I think it's smart business as far as that goes. They didn't go and get Hulk Hogan and say we're going to take on Monday Night Raw, right? Um, and right, I, and I think, and it, I don't, I, I don't think it's healthy to compare every other product to WWE, right? In, in right. the sense that okay, WWE is going to do a, 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 a ten million dollar profit in a quarter. But Ring of Honor, relative to their business model, uh, may be just as profitable when, when you break it down into percentages. Uh, um, but there's tangible growth in the live event attendance where they, they've done a thousand plus uh, uh, consistently. I know for a long stretch, and it may still be the case, every single town Ring of Honor had gone to in 2015, the live event attendance had increased from the last time it was there. 
Good. So, uh, and, and you can look in wrestling right now. I don't care what company you look at. Numbers are down across the board. Right. So for Ring of Honor to kind of be the only domestic company to stand up and, 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 and say, you know, we've got record numbers and we've got, you know, uh, numbers that, that, that haven't been attained in, 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 you know, in this setting, uh, maybe ever. Uh, to me, that's that's a huge, huge accomplishment for them. Um, you know, keep in mind, they, they are owned by a multi-million dollar company in Sinclair, but the goal was always to make Ring of Honor uh, uh, self-supportive. And, and it seems like it's uh, accomplishing that it's still around and it seems like that, uh, uh, there's even more, uh, uh, promising things in the future with the relationship with new Japan and, 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 uh, the continuation of the pay-per-views. Um, again, it's, it's a slow ascension, but it's, it's supply and demand. They're not going to get in your face and, 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 um, try to force it. Uh, they're going to grow as the demand grows. And, and so far, I mean, I don't think 10, 15 years ago, anybody would have expected Ring of Honor to get to the heights it has now. And I think its biggest years are still to come. Certainly, certainly. And, and I've noticed a little bit, I, I don't know if it feels like they're experimenting or something with venues here in the Pittsburgh area, but they have to seem to be uh, playing a little bit of hopscotch, I, I feel. Um, you know, jumping from Ross River to uh, Cal U down to West Virginia. Uh, again, I think they're kind of working out what their market is around the area. And I don't think they've done, done bad numbers in, in most of those locations either. So, Yeah, I, I, I don't know that their, uh, uh, their last event here was, was everything that they wanted and then some. No. Um, it, it's such a difficult balance uh, because they ran uh, uh, within the city. Uh, the, the Royal Rumble weekend a couple years ago, I know they had a few logistical errors doing that. I know they had a few logistical errors when they were here last September at, at Cal U, which is, you know, 60, 90 minutes away from the city. Uh, Ross Draver was not really conducive to what they wanted to do. And me being back there for Jim Cornette's uh, uh, anger spell, I uh, certainly know that firsthand that mm -hmm. Ross Draver was not the, uh, the the happiest place to be that day. Um but I survived and I'm, I'm, I'm alive. Thankfully. I, I, I just, when it comes to Pittsburgh, I think there's, there's a market to tap into, but they just haven't figured out the, the exact formula yet. I'm not sure there's what that a, is. There's a venue problem, right? And, and, and I think a lot of people look at Pittsburgh and I, you know, I, we, we talk about you know, any wrestling where it's like, why is it anybody of, of significance? I think I can safely say running downtown. Right. Uh, right. And I think uh, and I think, you know, what, you know, cost is one thing. They can't just go run uh, the, the even the smaller arenas at the at the at the uh, universities. They're still going to be cost out of out of town. Right. Yeah. Um, it, 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 it's cost. And then you have to figure in uh, 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 union fees and city taxes and all sorts of red tape that we who don't have to deal with the promoter BS mm -hmm. really never think about. And 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 thankfully, because it's not fun at all. Um, and, and just the level of competition, too, in the city, where right, you have the right. whole cultural district, district and you have the South Side, and you have Consol Energy Center, and you have concert venues. Uh, it's, it's a lot less competition when you're kind of, you know, in the suburbs 45 minutes away. Exactly. And if that's where the market is, then, then great. I think there's potential closer to the city. I would love to see uh, somebody run say within a, 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 a 15 or 20 minute radius of Pittsburgh, as opposed to, to 45 or 50. Um, but I don't know where, or what, and how, and, and thankfully that's not my job, but uh, I hope Ring of Honor can figure out a regular home, at least once or twice a year for Pittsburgh, add it to the regular schedule. Cause I think Pittsburgh would support what they're doing. This is a, a, a the type of, of, of passionate, Hardworking blue collar fans. There's a, there's a rich wrestling history here. Uh, Bruno San Martino did a signing with Ring of Honor here a few years ago. Um, obviously, Shane Douglas is around. Dominic Danucci. Um, you know, there's a market to tap into with that. Uh, Mark Madden's radio show was great exposure. Adam Cole was on uh, the Mark Madden show here in Pittsburgh a couple months ago when Ring of Honor was in town. So 
there's avenues to explore. It, it just needs to, to, you know, what it comes down to, if it doesn't make sense on paper, then, then everything else is, is trivial. And, um, I think, like you said, when, when they can find that home, then the rest will fall into place. Where is global force wrestling thing in all the, these days? Um, I know they've done TV tapings, but I know I haven't heard much news and I'm being a little close to the source. I, I, I don't know if you can share, like when are we going to see more than just uh, baseball shows? Uh, they, they have completed their, I forget if there's three or four tapings in Las Vegas at the Orleans Casino Resort, which is the same uh, venue that Ring of Honor did their anniversary pay-per-view at earlier this year. And they have signed a uh, international uh, television distribution deal, which I think puts them in the United Kingdom. Um, from what I understand, Global Force will be a little bit more seasonal. Uh, vis-a-vis closer to a Lucha Underground than a 52-week-a-year uh, program, at least at first, um, which I, I'm not going to fault. I, I think, again, if you're trying to launch a brand and build awareness, you don't want to get in too deep before you have that comfort zone. I haven't really heard anything about domestically. Um I know Jeff has a lot of resources and he has a lot of friends over the years, uh, connections in, in the business world and the wrestling world and the television world. Um, you know, I've said it before, uh, Jeff made history when he took a company, started it from scratch and turned it into a, a global, uh, global empire, global phenomenon in over a hundred countries. Um, no one had done that before. And now Jeff's trying to do it again. Uh, it's unprecedented. Um, but if, if somebody can do it, uh, you know, I, I think it's Jeff. I don't think the baseball shows were a really totally accurate reflection of the television product because you're dealing with two completely different audiences. Um, but from some of the things I've seen, uh, I've had a chance to, to sample some of the um, video packages uh, that'll air on Global Force Wrestling, Amp TV. And uh, they're top notch. It, it, it's state of the art. It's it's really high quality. Um, you can compare it to a TNA or a Dota V as far as their video quality in that regard. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing the shows as well. I hope they find a, a domestic outlet, whether it's cable, hey, whether it's Netflix. I don't really know. Um, I know they're looking at a, at a bunch of different options. Um, but uh, GFW does have uh, an international presence. If it hasn't premiered yet, I believe it is very, very soon. And, uh, hopefully that can carry over, uh, here to the U S as well. All right. Um, looking forward to see, see what happens with that. I mean, it, it, while there's, you know, there's a lot of moves, there's still a lot of options out there. And, you know, of course we've talked, uh, uh last couple of weeks with, uh, Lucha Underground with Chris and Joseph and everything, uh, especially seeing that coming back is really good to see, uh, as well. So, and I know I, you're, you're not, uh, you haven't really sampled much of Lucha Underground, at least like last we talked, right? I have not seen a lot of Lucha Underground because I do not get the English language. Uh, I don't get El Rey Network. So yeah, yeah. I get Unimas so I can watch the Spanish language replay, but that means they take away my Matt Stryker <laughs> and, and they give me uh, Hugo Savinovich and I love Hugo Savinovich. Uh, especially when he is selling someone falling through his announce table. Uh Um, (laughs) But it's not the same. I'm a type of guy where I need commentary to really get immersed in what's happening, preferably commentary I can understand. So um, I'm either going to have to binge watch online or hope for a DVD. I'm absolutely going to watch the show at some point. I've just only seen a couple episodes but even even without seeing enough to even tell you my likes and dislikes or if I'm a fan or not, um, I'm still elated that they're back for season two because, again, it's another option. It's another chance for growth for the business, a chance for something different for someone to sample and get involved if they're tired of WWE or if they just don't get WWE or or for whatever the, whatever the case may be. Um, and they have so many – hardworking athletes that deserve the opportunity um, not to single out anybody or leave out anybody. But of course the two closest to my heart would probably be Ricky Reyes and M dog 20 Matt Cross, uh, Cortez Castro and son of havoc, I believe mm-hmm. um, you know, those two guys have not gotten 
their just due um, on a national stage, uh, particularly M Dog, who I think has been criminally underrated for a decade now. So to see guys like that get a shot, it, it, it warms my heart. Um, maybe they wouldn't fit in in a certain WWE mold or or, or, or in in a, a predisposed um, you know archetype somewhere, but with this something new, something that they're helping create. Um, you know, anytime I've talked to them, it's been nothing, nothing but, but overwhelming positivity from them both. And, and I'm very happy to see them both get the chance and up and down the roster. There, there, there's guys and girls like that who just need that chance. And if they fall on their face, so be it, but, uh, let them do their thing. So I hope Lucha Underground really finds their niche and really keeps building their audience and, and keeps their costs down and they can be viable to, to El Rey and, and anywhere else they, they can be fortunate enough to expand to for a long time to come. Awesome. Awesome. Go check them out. Uh, thanks Joe. And, uh, stick around. We're going to be talking about survivor series coming up on the big, the big fat, uh, of course, and uh, 25 years of undertaker of all people. And, uh, but in the meantime, Mike, it's yes, pizza sir. time. It's pizza time. Oh man. Sorg. Is it ever pizza time? I, I... <laughs> There is one slice of uh, slice on Broadway waiting for me in that box for when we finish podcast day today. I'm so excited for it. I, I may take it home with me. You want to take it with you on the mega bus tomorrow? Yes. Oh no, I might. I don't think it's a good idea. I haven't decided yet. Um, my bet is I will probably have it in my hands and immediately just eat it because I can't. I can't take not having Slice on Broadway in my hands and then immediately putting it in my mouth because it's that delicious. Slice on Broadway. Put it in your mouth. <laughs> Go check them out. They're here in uh, they're Pittsburgh, like PA, so uh, right here along uh, Beachview, along the tracks, and uh, down in Main Street in Carnegie, PA. Carnegie. Carnegie. PA. Carnegie. Carnegie. Close. Um, go check out my slice on broadway.com and uh, pgh underscore slice on the tours. Let them know you heard about them on uh, the Wrestling Mayhem show, which is not some of those parts in the middle there. And that a New Yorker is digging it as well in Mad Bike. Uh, and go check all that out. Uh, slice on broadway.com. Supporting the Pittsburgh podcasting with the perfect pepperoni pizza. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, let's uh, talk about the Survivor Series coming up this weekend. Of course, that's the wrong one. There it is. Survivor Series. It is a deadly game. Uh, I know a few of us have been watching the deadly game uh, year of the Survivor Series, and I got that tune in my head uh, that, from the beginning beginning of it. Uh, uh, we do have the uh, Undertaker 25th anniversary uh, celebration that's going to happen. Uh, tombstones all around, of course. And uh, I, I personally kind of hoping that this is going to be a... a can it just turn into the Triple H and Sting match where everybody from Undertaker's history just comes back and 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 he just tombstones them one after another, uh, like 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 Wyatt's power just like resurrects Papa Shango and Mordecai and, and everybody else. Sister and Mordecai. Sure, sure. What, what what's that, Mike? I'm kind of hoping we get Sister Abigail. Out you think of that this. that should happen here? Yes, I, I think if there's a time for the throne of the Undertaker to be unseated. Mm-hmm. It has to be due to like sister Abigail and like, why not? Let's say it's Undertaker's mom. Why not? Like, let's actually make them related. Like Undertaker's mom, we knew was, let's say a little loose. I mean, she banged Paul Bearer and out came Kane. She banged Undertaker's well, dad, whoever that is. Now t- out came Undertaker. Bear. What's that? What's that? LB? <laughs> Paul Bear was the sexiest thing to ever happen. Who wouldn't bang Paul Bear? What was that? I, I'm not. I'm, I mean, I'm not faulting her decisions. I'm just saying, we have Big Daddy Dudley. How about Big Mama Taker? <laughs> he died in the wow. fire. No. Right. Yeah. Sure. And so did Kane. Okay, that's true. And so. So my needs. Kate, it, sorry, sorry. All right, I'm painting. I'm painting a picture. What we need a wrestling is a wrestling video on Undertaker, basically. Well, yeah, but why not have whoever went to the remnants of the Undertaker and Kane's family house, and in the ashes, a swamp monster rolled up and swallowed <laughs> what? <laughs> 
The Wyatt. The one with Chuck Taylor? Yes. So okay. that's when we bring in yeah, that's when we bring in the gentleman's club's uh, swamp monster to the <laughs> to, to Abigail. It works perfectly. See, it's it's all a rich it's all a rich tapestry sword. So do head scissor takedowns, it'll be great. <laughs> Either that or under or Undertaker's mom just had a dalliance down in New Orleans and eventually, you know, baby Bray came up and he found out that he is the true heir to the Undertaker's powers. Dabra- it works. Dabrowski, I'm, I'm trying to bring this back down to earth. Uh, you know, you're you're, you're 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 talking about an undead mortician and his burnt alive brother. There is no reality in this. He's not wrong. He's not wrong. <laughs> All right, something interesting is going to happen, and I hope it involves lightning. I, We've I, had a lot of lightning lately. You, you really Isn't don't think it's weird, just going to be a squash? Like, like this being the 25th anniversary of Taker's debut, he's in a tag match with Kane against two members of the Wyatt family that we don't know yet. It is kind of weird. That, that is strange. Like, 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 here's the four of them, and I beat up, we beat up four of them, and, and now we're down to two. I, I, I don't know how much that makes sense. There's going to be a lot of tomfoolery in this. I feel. Well, yeah, because up until very recently, The Undertaker only wrestled once a year, so a tag match is great for him. Yeah, yeah, I mean, in that, in that aspect, definitely. It's just, I don't know, I feel like 25th anniversary you when we heard about that we we're like oh they're gonna do something big like taker versus john cena or taker versus sting or something. I mean, obviously they can't do either of those things right now but um yeah i, I don't know i think so it should just be... gotta be involved right <laughs> of course yeah. that's you Undertaker versus Ted DiBiase Jr. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I hope I hope we get some of those DiBiase posse parties in the. Oh. That's what just all. That's what all the the druids were last night. Last night they were just all members of the DiBiase posse. That's it. It'd be great what, if all the druids is. were just people who have lost in casket matches to the Undertaker. Like there was a Kamala representative. There was the Executioner. It was Giant Gonzalez. <laughs> Wow. Unfortunately, we can't do Kamala. Because well, he mean, like, lost a leg. We can't do a lot. Or of Yoka. We can't, can't do a lot of them. Yeah. Uh, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Michelle McCool is Sister Abigail from Garza in the chat. Oh, Garza, we don't agree on much. But that's genius. <laughs> Let's make it happen. That is genius. <laughs> uh, Joe, what do you think about the Undertaker 25th anniversary? What do you, what do you, what do you think we, sh- we should see out of this uh, Survivor Series this weekend? Well, I'm I'm very pleased that WWE is finally marketing an anniversary that's actually the anniversary, <laughs> as opposed to when WrestleMania 25 was the 25th anniversary magically when it was actually the 24th. But I digress. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I, I echo the sentiments that it, it, it's very odd to have Taker and Kane uh, beat down everybody, and and we have a two on two environment. Um, they've been so they being Taker and Kane have been so untouchable since uh, the initial heat that it feels like a lot of that interest, a lot of that momentum is kind of um, worn off. They've beaten up the whole family. They beat up all the Druids. What am I paying to see? Um, I'm not impressed by the fact that because he abducted the undertaker bray wyatt has the powers to rerun the opening raw pyro whenever he wants um (laughs) but that's that's par for the course there's been so much chicanery and falderall with the undertaker over the years you've just kind of learned to accept it we've we've been um we've been pavlov's dogs into it uh uh uh, you know we've just been conditioned to expect uh lightning and fireworks and um you know somebody may die and then come back to life a few months later it just happens um it's part it's part of the process so i agree there's going to be a lot of smoke and mirrors there's going to be a lot of chicanery i don't know what you're going to do um logic points to harper and rowan being the two guys in the match because you want to protect stroman uh uh and wyatt too true to his character would sit outside in the rocking chair, but that's not your most competitive match. And do you just have another top baby face run through Bray Wyatt, or do you put the proverbial rocket ship up Bray's rear end and give him 
you know, the biggest boost with, with the exception of if he would have uh, been in the Brock spot to end the streak, the, the biggest boost in the sense that you put him over the most protected character um, and, and, and use that to shoot him up. And, and honestly, that's not a bad idea because looking at Raw, um, other than Bray and Paige – and Kevin Owens, there were no top heels. So um, somebody needs to rise up and fill that void that's been left not just by Rollins, but by the fact that there's no top-tier guys that have really been been shot up lately. So um, I hope that we see a career night for Bray Wyatt, um, but it's not necessarily what I expect being the uh, the 25th anniversary of you know, if if they do give the Wyatt, Wyatt needs to, and his family need to be a monster, just destroying everything up through WrestleMania. Needs to be. Yeah. If they do this, um, but I, I don't. Even if they don't, they they, they kind of need to be to for them, you know, to do something with them at WrestleMania. To be quite honest, I, I'm still a little disappointed that Bray wasn't involved in this title tournament at all. Because you could have Bray involved in the tournament and have him and have a three on two handicap match with the rest of the Wyatt family against Taker and Kane. And then you can have Taker and Kane beat down the family all, all you want, but if Bray wins that belt, you know, it's it's a net it's a net gain. Yeah, I think I think they're at a place now and, and hopefully it does change eventually because they will have like if, if the if the rate of things have been going now the They'll need to change, but Bray has never been like in the direction of the heavyweight title. Like I feel like he's always it's always just a you know he wants to torment someone or, or something along those lines. But he's never really been after any championships. Um, but yeah, I can see what you're saying, and, and like like the Joe said, like there's a bit of bit of a void left right now on the WWE roster that needs to be filled, and and. He was hoping that you know either Bray or somebody else can fill it in, in the meantime. Certainly. Well, let's look at the rest of the card here for Survivor Series. Uh, we got the WWE tournament uh, title tournament. Uh, we got uh, three matches going to be coming out of that. Uh, our semifinals and our final, which I think are set up to be pr- some pretty good matches. I think. Uh, I think every, geez, everybody seemed to set, step up on Raw as we discussed last night on the Raw wrap up. Um, but uh, I'm looking forward to see what that is. Although I feel like all of us are kind of expecting Ambrose and Reigns to be the finals. I really hope it's, it's kind of it. positioned that way. Yeah. I think it's yeah. a safe bet. Yeah. I hope it's not, though. Yeah, I, I hope they do mix it up a little bit, even if it's like Reigns, Owens, or something like I that. I hope it's neither of them. <laughs> neither of them? You yeah. want, you want <laughs> I to hope Seth Owens. Rollins comes out in a wheelchair or crutches or something and causes both of them to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, that w- and it would be the perfect. Dick move for Seth Rollins to do that, like, because because in actuality, if the WWE champion cannot compete, it should be the IC champ and the US champ vying for that belt. Because back in the day, the secondary belt holders were the number one contenders. More so in NWA WCW, though, I think. Yeah, but I mean, for the most part. But but I, I see what you're getting. They're still like should be the guy more or less next in line, right? Yeah. So certainly, certainly. I. I see this the, the tournament going one of two ways, and uh, I think everyone's talking. About, I, I think as much as the side of who's going to be the champion, it's also the story has also been who's joining the authority now, and um, obviously playing off of the past Survivor Series uh, tournament. Um, to me, it goes one of either two ways: either one, Roman Reigns turns heel, which is a thing that a lot of people are predicting, uh, and joins the authority. He sells out. He, he he goes the way of his cousin. Um, or two, Kevin Owens takes it. And Kevin Owens becomes the top heel in the company. Because I feel like Owens has been protected since he's come to the WWE. Mm-hmm. In the sense, you know, he, I mean, beating John Cena, he's, you know, I feel like out of anybody, he's been the one that's been sort of, not, I, I don't want to say treated the best, but has been given a lot and, and, you know, for somebody so new in the company, you know, he's not even been here, been in the company for like a year. And, you know, he's challenging the WWE championship now. Like, I feel like they have some really 
big trust in Owens. And if we need somebody to fill that void that Rollins left, Owens could be the one to do it. Owens is good enough, but I find it hard to believe that WWE would kind of set aside their cosmetics heavy approach Mm -hmm. to making Owens the very top guy. Uh, To me, Ambrose is the one out of the four that's had the most organic response, Mm -hmm. the most organic following. It should be Dean Ambrose's night. Um, As a fan favorite, if Roman turns, so be it. Um, But if Roman, if anybody expects Roman as a fan favorite to win it, it's going to be crapped on. It's not going to work. And, and looking at Roman Reigns, honestly, this past year, it's a great, um, it's a great lesson for uh, uh, indie wrestling bookers. I, I wish indie wrestling bookers and promoters understood more. It only takes one bad night to damage a character beyond repair. Mm-hmm. And Roman has never recovered from the Rumble in Philadelphia. Not even close. Um, closest he came was WrestleMania, but but even then in front of that crowd, it wasn't going to happen. Um, not to say Roman can't be rebuilt, can't be changed. Uh, he'll get there eventually, absolutely. But absolutely not as soon as or in the straight linear path that WWE wanted him to. Um and that might not stop them from trying, as we saw in the Rumble. They may be stubborn and just go ahead with it. But to me, Ambrose is the closest guy that the fans will buy into in that role. In this day and age, not to say fans are, are necessarily smarter, um, but they demand more. Right. And they can see through being force-fed something uh, a lot more now than they used to, for whatever the case may be. Uh, this Roman Reigns plan would have worked perfectly 10, 15 years ago. Now, not so much. They want a Dean Ambrose, or they want a Daniel Bryan, or they want uh, a Dolph Ziggler, whatever the case or may be. Or Cesaro. Or Cesaro, exactly. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're very demanding and they're very passionate, um, and and they're not going to be silenced. Now that Donovy has chosen to give them such a voice on social media, well, now they shoot themselves in the foot when the fans actually use it. So if it was me, Dean Ambrose comes out on top, but uh, I've been wrong before, and I'm sure I'll be wrong plenty of times again. Um, uh, from the chat room, Garza, again, with all the authority work on uh, uh, on Monday, I, I think he wants to say, uh, you know there's a swerve coming with all, all the teasing. The biggest swerve will be Ambrose. Uh, I think everybody kind of expects that at this point, right? At least like the people are kind of looking at it. Uh, Carlin's is trying to convince himself that, uh, that it could be Del Rio since he, uh, <laughs> so he can be fed back to Cena in a month. Uh, but ADR is ice cold right now. And I agree with that. I don't think he's over with anybody other than that first night. Uh, yeah. he also feels like uh, Roman and Dean game more by defeating a reigning champ, winning a vacant title feels hollow. And, and Carlin's actually had a really good article on wrestling show.com last week where he talks about, Hey, um, how you know? Again, we've had some vacancies over the last couple of years, but even the, the the title ones that you've had were champs not getting beaten, be it you know three way triple threats or whatever the mm-hmm. case may be, or tournaments or something like that. We don't, we haven't had a solid title change that really pushed an agenda uh, since solidly beat Cena. since since yeah since Lesnar beat Cena basically, and I was like, what two years ago at this point. Mm-hmm. So I, I think I've, he's got that thought in my head a lot too. So um, real quick, I want to touch on uh, just a super quick thought. If I can just go around the horn on uh, uh, the ladies going into this. Um, I, I thought, and, and Eamon, first, I want your comments from last night because I saw your tweets around midnight last night, our time, uh, 11 <laughs> o'clock central time. Um, reiterate again, if you can recall, what you said about the end to Raw with uh, Paige and Charlie. Well, I think it's something, and I've kind of mentioned it on the show before, is that I feel the biggest failing of the, the Divas Revolution, but also really current, the current WWE product in general, is fan investment. Uh, there's very few characters right now that I think fans are really honestly invested in. Um, and especially with the Divas Revolution, for example, where they're introducing all these new characters, I feel like the important thing that they needed to do was tell those characters' stories 
Um, and, and I feel like them, uh, people were, a lot of people were up in arms last night over what happened. Uh, for those that didn't see it, the contract signing between Charlotte and Paige that ended the draw. Uh, they brought up a lot about uh, Reed Flair, who was uh, Charlotte's brother, who uh, a few years ago died of a uh, heroin overdose uh, at 25. Um, but the thing is, I feel like, is it a taboo subject? Is it something that makes people, you know, feel uncomfortable necessarily? Yes. But it's it's real, and it's something that's a part of Charlotte's character and who she is, and the fact that she mentioned, like, the reason that she's there is because of her of her brother. Uh, for those that don't watch uh, Table for Three, I mean, she brought it up in Table for Three how uh, she was attending, a, uh, I believe, a dinner for uh, one of Ric Flair's Hall of Fame inductions, and there were talent scouts there that were scouting both her and Reed. And she talked about how Reed was so excited that they may be able to go up to WWE together. And it was a big thing. And it wasn't too long after that that Reed passed away. Um, and I feel like when you introduce that aspect, it gets people behind Charlotte. I mean, I, you, I listened to her story on Table for Three, and I think it's, it's hard not to get behind her. It's hard not to support her. And um, I don't think there's a problem using that kind of stuff because, you know, you see the real emotion that comes from, you know, something obviously so tragic as that, that, you know, why not use it to, you know, you know, bring, put, put some oomph and some emphasis into a story. Right. You know, I, I personally thought it was really well done. And it's not like they didn't do it without like Charlotte poking. Well, you know what Charlotte, I mean? From what I've read, Charlotte was the one who suggested that Paige do that. Right, right. It's it, it just like, you know, supposedly we had the approval of the family of Paul Bearer when they did the CM Punk Undertaker angles yeah. with it. I mean, this is, people get it if they're It's as old school as you can get. Right. Like, it's, it's digging into it. Like, it's what we want. I mean, it's what we want from the Divas since the hashtag Divas Revolution started. We want characters that we can invest in, not teams that are just marketed together with a hashtag TCB. Hashtag team bad. Like they didn't have individual characters that now we know why Charlotte's here. We know why she wants to be champion. And it was a little out of character for Paige, but you need a big bad with the bells. Right, going. right, right. It, 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 Paige more and more is not just kind of being a, uh, being the bitch in this just to be the bitch in this either. Yeah. Like she has a motivation. And that there was also a back and forth between Paige and Lana on Twitter. Really? Yeah, uh, Lana. I think Paige also. I feel like Paige, to a degree, is like, like we talk about like realism, I guess, with the use of like the stuff with Charlotte's angle. I feel like there's a realism with Paige because she's much on Total Divas and and on other stuff like that. She's very much trying to portray herself as kind of somebody who doesn't, you, you know. I, I don't think she's a terrible person, but I think that she, you know, talk, you know, talks crap. That's that's just how she's being portrayed. I think universally on total divas on social media and stuff like that so i feel like it's part of her character to maybe say something like that because she knows it'll get under charlotte's skin or, or say something so ridiculous that it'll piss her off or something like that from the chat um, from the chat i'm sorry amen uh from the chat garza uh we gotta get on our side of this uh he says he's cheap heat it's a quick uh, uh quick on building heat with uh with the wrestling I think quick out. I think I read that wrong. Uh, he also thinks the idea that Charlotte is there because of Reed and not her own dream uh, of being a champ uh, is, is wrong. Um, and Carlin's agrees uh, it's a shortcut, but it is also kind of worked because the match feels hotter. I, and I think it's not just they said the thing and that was it. I think that follow up and the physical interaction uh, really kind of stepped it up too. It also helped that it actually did main event raw. Mm -hmm. Like oh, the, yeah. the segment oh, did main event crap. raw. Like like it was. And that was like, I know we hate pull on apart a very brawls. good raw too. Yeah, I, like I we hate pull apart brawls. That was a pull apart brawl. I don't hate to pull apart brawls. Some, Who hates pull some... apart brawls? I mean, hey, show of hands. Renee Goulet and Tony Guerrero would be very pissed. <laughs> there you go. There, there you are you go. a lot of people who don't like pull apart brawls that don't seem realistic. The one they did with Taker and Brock was great. The yeah. one they did with Paige and Charlotte just now was fantastic. What? But like. Roman Reigns. Okay. He never looks believable in a pull apart brawl. Okay. He doesn't. He, he never Can't does. sell the pull apart brawl, bro. Nope. No? Mm -mm. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I, I didn't know that there was a heat on pull apart brawls oh, lately. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. There All is. right. All right. 
Um, any other thoughts on the ladies before we move on here? Uh, yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was good. I thought, you know, I, I think it was a necessary, a necessary evil, I guess you could say. But yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like we, we say a lot. I think the reason the NXT is really good is from the fact that they take those moments to like show glimpses of the wrestlers as people, and it allows you to get a better investment into them as wrestlers. Um, so that's sort of a small case of them doing that here, and I, and I really did appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the future of the business. You have yeah. to you have to integrate the organic realism of the person into the character. You have to present it in a way that's not hokey and it's not cartoonish. And I love the segment. Uh, they they both look like stars. You had a point of view. You had an opinion. You, everybody was emotionally invested. They had an opinion, whether they loved it or they hated it. They talked about it. It, it stirred up controversy and. It makes me want to see the match more. Um, you know, Paige comes off very natural. She doesn't come off like someone reciting lines. Mm. Uh, uh, Charlotte has the the uh, uh, the flair genetics, which means she can cry, and a lot, <laughs> and and that helps. Um, you know, there's not a lot on Raw that will that will grab my attention, being uh, uh, a miserable, bitter jaded man like i am after 13 years in wrestling um but that was one of them that uh i don't see it as a shortcut i don't see it as an evil i don't see anything wrong with that at all and i don't think anybody not named flair can claim that there is um that's that's part of the business and they're smart enough to know um you know the, the ends justify the means and and um it's absolutely not a negative reflection on Reed Flair. You know, that's, that's, that's giving him a spotlight. That's, that's putting him over by mentioning his name. Um, which is another thing a lot of people don't get, uh, uh, you know, if they wanted to bury him, they would ignore him and erase him from history, you know, but you put him over, he's, he's an, he's a focal part of the story. And I'm sure anybody that knows Reed Flair well enough to comment would say that Reed Flair would appreciate the hell out of that. Um, and they built a match, and they're actually doing what they need to do with this this uh, uh, Divas Revolution is, like you guys said, create two personalities that we care about and uh, uh, present that conflict. And, and it was it was simple, but it was really well done, and, and they both ended up looking like stars. Awesome. And honestly, you have to build one title match because your lower card champions are involved in a tournament. We don't know what the main event is. And the heat for the Taker, Kane, and Wyatt stuff is kind of slow building. So this kind of seems like, the as far as actual booked matches, it's kind of the main event. I think you can look at this was not going to get this kind of energy behind it and spotted it did on Raw if we didn't if have Rollins the didn't tournament. If yeah, it Rollins wasn't for the Seth hurt. Rollins. So it would have been a lot different feel. Well, hey, if you like women's wrestling, we got your women's wrestling right here. Not right here. Not not with Mike on the couch or, or anything was, like that. No, 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 Mike, around, Mike. It's okay, Mike. It's okay. okay. No, I'm talking about over at IndieWrestling.us. We got some uh, great stuff over there. Hey, this stuff is flying off of the digital sh sh shelves, actually. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of people buying up the latest matches from the International Wrestling Cartel and the Renegade Wrestling Alliance, to be honest. Uh, you know, uh, Featuring a lot of great girls here in the area, like Raylan, like uh, Britt Baker, Angel Dust. Uh, Marty Bell of TNA popping up actually, and actually these these ladies are going to be in a tag match here with IWC in December, and uh, Jesse Bell Smothers and, and and the women of uh, of Vicious Outcast Wrestling, uh, but just as sexy is uh, Joe Dabrowski hanging out with uh, Virgil uh, at, at the, uh, the the legend of his uh, uh, traveling merchandise table and so much more. Uh, uh, but Joe, you. You got, you got a. Uh, we have some new stuff on here uh, from north of the border. It looks like uh, from Border City Wrestling. Can you tell us what's going on with that? Uh, I would just like to point out, as far as the sexiness of me and Virgil on that DVD cover. Mm, look at that! Uh, look at that! Can you imagine the combined penis size on that cover? I mean, just think about it, and think about it often, and uh, and frequently, and. Uh, uh, think about it while you're pressing your PayPal button. I feel, I feel. And that, that might be a metaphor. I don't but know. I'm not going to tell you if it is or not. I don't know how I feel um, because I, I took that picture and uh, you did. I, you did. Mm. So imagining that Sorg was the one who also took the picture, 
Imagine that combined penis size photo. We're setting new records. We absolutely <laughs> are. Um, man, I gave myself a great segue here, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, um, Water City Wrestling. Yeah, enough about uh, uh, underneath the border of my pants and now above the border uh, into Canada. Um, Border City Wrestling is now on IndieWrestling.us. That's correct. Uh, Border City Wrestling has been around for over 20 years. A lot of people may know it as the outfit that Scott Demore is uh, uh, largely behind. Um, a lot of top name talents have come out of there. You can talk about Bobby Roode and Eric Young, Alex Shelley, Chris Sabin, um, you know, John Bolin, who, uh, uh, you know, uh, Pittsburgh fans know very well. He was trained by Scott. Uh, Rhino's done a lot of work up there. And uh, I'm very, very proud and honored that um, a couple of the most recent Border City events are on uh, not just digital on IndieWrestling.us, but on DVD through joe-dombrowski.com. Uh, there was a show called Excellence about a year ago uh, uh, that was headlined by a number of amazing things. Bret Hart made an appearance. Uh, Big Papa Pump Scott Steiner was in a tag team match. Uh, teaming with Cody Diener against John Bolin and the big uh, six foot, six plus inch Congo Kong. Uh, there was a, a crazy four way tag team match that was in the main event. The Time Splitters, Alex Shelley and Kushida, uh, Chris Sabin and Phil Atlas, Psycho Mike Rollins and Michael Elgin. And who's the fourth team? The Syndicate of, I believe, Brad Martin and Tyson Dukes. Um, that match went about 35 minutes. It was insane. Uh, I was privileged enough to call that show with the franchise Shane Douglas. It was a sold-out uh, college campus, 1,000, 1,500. I'm not really sure how many people were there, but, but it was packed, and the energy was up. Rhino wrestled Joe Doring. Joe Doring at the time was the All Japan Pro Wrestling Triple Crown Champion. It was the first time that the All Japan Triple Crown was defended outside of Japan. So it was pretty historic. Um, and the show I'm most proud of is called East Meets West, because that is the best of Border City Wrestling versus the best of New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I had the opportunity to work with Okada, Nakamura, Tanahashi, um, Watanabe, uh, Alex Shelley and Kushida. Uh, Tiger Hattori was the referee. And uh, uh, New Japan took on Border City in a best of five series. So you have Petey Williams and Chris Sabin and Tyson Dukes and, and, and Bolin and Doring and guys like that. Uh, main event is Congo Kong and Cody Diener with Booker T as, uh, as the special guest enforcer. And Booker T and Scott Demore have their run in as well. And uh, uh, if you were a fan of, of Matt Stryker's work on Wrestle Kingdom 9 earlier this year, you'll enjoy this DVD as well because – I had the privilege of being carried by Matt Stryker throughout the show. <laughs> hey, um, Matt Stryker flipped me off at a Meatball show. Well, I remember that. That was yeah, cool. yeah. Um, I was like, please don't touch the mic, sir. <laughs> yeah, you 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 had it. You had it coming. I, I did. I did. Well, it was up. We have crappy mics. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, and who would have guessed? With there, there's mustaches on them and weird cords wrapped all over the place. It's it's a great setup. But yeah. I digress. Um. No, it works. It's good for me. Um, uh, uh, Stryker, um, obviously, is a, is a huge fan of everything and anything <laughs> pro wrestling. He is. Uh, he is a total wrestling nerd. And he knew a lot more about these guys going in than I did. Uh, uh, so it was great for us to bounce off of each other. He was a little bit more familiar. So he could be a little more impassioned and I could be a bit more, I guess, analytical uh, towards it. And... Uh, I was really happy with, with, with how it worked out. And, and that was my first time seeing Nakamura and my first time seeing uh, Okada and Tanahashi into what they'd grown into, as opposed to when they were uh, uh, young boys in, in the U S beforehand. So, so um, it really wasn't until later I got to appreciate um, what a special event that it was. Uh, uh, but, but just the same being in the moment and, and being able to call something like um the Time Splitters versus Petey Williams and Brent Banks, which may have been my favorite match of, of 
all of 2014 to have called. Uh, it's one of those things where you can just you can just feel in the moment that, that something truly special is going on. So uh, I'm very proud of those shows. Uh, they're on DVD and digital. And uh, Border City is the most organized and professionally run independent promotion I've worked for. So uh, and that's not a knock on anybody. That's, uh, uh, you know, as much as I hate waking up at 1030 in the morning to go to a production meeting, uh, I also appreciate it very much because I know what's going on. I know what's expected of me and everything. Everything's laid out. Unlike, you know, independent wrestling in general, where it's 10 minutes before bell time and sometimes your thumb is still up your rear end. Hmm. Um, and again, not a knock. That's just the, the frenetic breakneck pace of pro wrestling where there's never enough time to do anything. Um, but I appreciate the production value and, and the organization of Border City. And uh, I hope you guys check it out too. And, and hopefully we'll be able to present more if you guys like what you see. Awesome. Go check it out. IndieWrestling.us as well as the uh, great column by Matt Carlin's Around the Indies to find out what you missed this weekend. And uh, kind of catch up and introduce yourself to some new things. Uh, so we're going to take a look at what happened last week in Sorgatronmedia.com podcast and Hobo Web Series, and we'll be right back. Um, all of the Android Priv Instagram photos with funny captions that other people made up. Uh, uh, maybe I laugh and smile and order a bunch more pillows on my phone, and this relationship will become bearable. <laughs> you give me a tiny person? What's wrong with his arms? He's got lines sticking out of his arms. Uh, Matt Carlin, our friend in the mainstream media, is doing a real great job case here. And it's also a very visual kind of thing. Uh, so you can get a nice... There's a, there's a chick just getting blasted in the face. There you go. I don't even know where that was or who that was. But you can go explore it over on IndieWrestling.us slash blog. <laughs> All right, check out that on so much more uh, with uh, SorgatronMedia.com. A lot of great uh, shows that we're putting on out there. So uh, with us, with the big question, is Papa Lunchbox? What do you got for us this week? Well, Sorg, uh, I've been uh, I've been thinking about because we got Joe Dombrowski here, and we're talking a lot about uh, uh, indie wrestling and everything like that. And uh, as uh, I believe it was Eamon mentioned earlier, the a, a few of the divas got in a fight over uh, over Twitter. And it still remains to be seen whether that's uh, legitimate or not. You know what I mean? Um, and uh, it, it got me thinking about how the world is a vastly different place than it was uh, five, even ten years ago. Um, you've got social media. You've got live streaming events. Uh, and, and you've got NXT. And um, so my question to the, uh, the assembled panel and anybody out there listening is, um, in this brave new world, what is the best way that an indie wrestler can get ahead. Hmm. Uh, is, it, is it just the same way it ever was? Put on good matches and let word of mouth take off, or uh, or since there's the opportunity to be more proactive, is that a must nowadays? Uh, I I think there's a few different components to it. Um, I mean, match quality helps obviously, but you need the right platform to bounce off of. Obviously, if you're at a PWG or an Evolve or Ring of Honor or whatever the case may be, there is going to be a lot more sets of eyes on you. Um, you can have the best match in the world, but if nobody knows it or nobody's there to see it, then it really doesn't matter. Uh, social media is huge, and I could do three hours right now on what's wrong with wrestlers on social media. Um, what to do a special to, edition. To really try to streamline it. You have wrestlers out there that spend thousands of dollars to build an image with their bodies in the gym and their gear and tanning and doing their hair and, and all across the board, um, including and up to uh, their matches, their promos, how they present themselves, how they present their character. And then they'll go online and they will post a photo smiling, shaking hands, and hugging with the guy that he just tried to murder in the ring last night. Or he will post a, a uh, message complaining about his day job. Or he will post a whiny uh, message about um, how little friends he has, or he's got a relationship problem, or anything that would make a fan go, well, 
why am I paying to see this guy? Um, the Young Bucks are the smartest guys in independent wrestling right now. And I don't just say that because Matt Jackson owns a copy of The Legend of Virgil, although it doesn't hurt. <laughs> um, I, I say that because half the people look at the Bucks on Twitter and thinks it's hilarious and and is quote unquote getting the joke and the other half think they're the most cocky overwhelming overbearing a-holes that have no respect for anybody and i don't agree with everything the bucks do um but i side with them a heck of a lot more than i side with their critics they know how to create a groundswell of buzz and discussion uh, and believability through social media, where it's not a character. It's Matt and Nick Jackson, uh, uh, the person and the characters, fused together. Uh, uh, you need to know how to get yourself over out of the ring as well, because it's not just seeing you once a month anymore. You need to be able to go online and convince people why they need to take money out of their wallet and pay to see you just like back in the day when you'd stand in front of gene Oakland and cut a 90 second promo in the market specifics this saturday in pittsburgh i'm coming to the arena that's been replaced by twitter um and then when they get there you have to deliver and there ha there can't be a disconnect between the person they see in the ring and the person that they're reading the post from on twitter um to me that's that's cognitive dissonance that doesn't make any sense to me at all um, I want characters I can believe in. Uh, uh, and I always use this example. Anybody that thinks kayfabe is dead, do a poll of how many people thought Punk sitting on the, the uh, 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 entryway in Las Vegas was a shoot. Everybody bought it because everybody wanted to believe it. And Punk became the biggest thing in wrestling. Daniel Bryan was the next biggest thing in wrestling because everybody believed that the company was legitimately holding him down and he was legitimately the hardest worker and he legitimately would never get the world title. And that was probably true at one point, but the people got behind him and it made his career. People buy into the Bucks now. People buy into Dolph, Cesaro, Ziggler. Uh, well, I just said that. Uh, whoever. Um, you know, people aren't buying into what they see as manufactured. Um, so I've gone on for entirely too long, but in short, create a brand and market it. And realize that just because you leave the ring, um, you're not done working and you're not done selling yourself. You are never done selling yourself. Sure. I, I uh, really agree completely with Joe. And I do think that aspect of marketing, I think, is the big deal. Um, there have been, obviously, a lot of talented independent wrestlers that have got signed recently. But I feel like the ones that have been skyrocketed or, or really put the focus on I think right now in WWE is you know your Kevin Owens your Finn Balor's uh, even though it was a while back your Sami Zayn's uh, and all of those people had something about themselves that they marketed in some way or another obviously Sami Zayn had El Generico and, and became sort of an indie like cult hero in a sense same with uh, Kevin Owens who was very much synonymous with indie wrestling uh, Finn Balor had been, you know, wrestling as Prince Devin and having amazing matches, um, you know, killing it for years. But, uh, and I'm not saying he got signed because of this, but like the whole body paint stuff, like, got, opened him to a wider audience of people. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, like, when he was still on the independence, people sharing videos of, oh, what did uh, Prince Devin wear next, you know? Look at look at him as the Joker. Look at him as as this comic book character. Um, there is a level of marketability that goes beyond just having phenomenal matches. Because there's talents right now that have been recently signed that are are phenomenal wrestlers and and uh, put on phenomenal matches that are still getting the same sort of um, uh, level of not not to the level of like a Kevin Owens where his first match in on NXT was on a takeover and he immediately skyrocketed to becoming a big deal. There's talented people in that in developmental right now that they're still taking time on and they're still um, uh, working on. And I think the difference I could just tell between those two you know, sections is just that level of marketing. Um, 
completely agree with Joe about social media. That's a huge aspect of it. Um, and yeah, I, I think I just, just summing up what Joe said, like what you do beyond the ring is as much important as what you do in the ring. Mike? Uh, yeah, well, I, this goes kind of along, kind of along the same lines as marketing, but I think there also has to be some kind of like viral component to your character. Like you need a way to get out there beyond just the world of professional wrestling. Like I remember a couple years ago, um, a clip of Cesaro or back then Claudio Castagnoli in, in Chikara doing the giant spin where he went like a hundred revolutions around blew up on the internet like between and you know now he is where he is today i'm not saying that's entirely that reason but it got him a lot of notice and a lot of notoriety and like just a couple weeks like a month or so ago the young bucks were at, at midnight because they super kicked the child in the face for for his birthday party <laughs> and like you have you have stuff like the punk promo where he'll throw out like the ring of honor reference and all that stuff and you have Daniel Bryan's yes chant going viral in college football stadiums. You need something like that's why the Attitude Era works so well because you had your Rocks, you had your Austin three sixteen, you had the NWO, you had DX. You had stuff that was easily imitatable or easily digested for people who aren't fans of professional wrestling, and they can say, "Oh wow." that is really cool or that's different. Maybe I should check that out. I think that, I mean, I'm not saying people should go try and make a viral video or, or a viral chant or something because you can't do it, but you have to kind of hope that something you're doing when you're building your brand sticks. Like you have to try and be as different and unique as possible and really, really stand out. So from the chat, or what? LB. LB. LB goes last, right? Is that how this works? What? It's been so long. What? What do you got, LB? Oh God, I threw my phone on the floor. Okay, <laughs> we'll come back to LB. <laughs> um, I agree. It's it's a rich tapestry. Um, you can be the best wrestler in the world and the best on the mic, but if you're wrestling in the middle of Iowa, um, the I mean, the, uh, if you're not promoting yourself, the odds of people um, further out outside of your um, your sphere of influence, I mean, the odds are better because of social media. But if you're not putting yourself out there, then it's, it's not likely. Um, I think I think these guys did cover it pretty well. It's not there's no basic simple approach anymore. It's no it's no longer just go out and do good matches. It's Go out, do good matches, have a good personality, have a good in-ring style, put your stuff on the internet, hope that your stuff gets gets you know picked up by at midnight or, or or wherever. You know what I mean? Go on podcasts like the Indie Mayhem Show or the Wrestling Mayhem Show. <laughs> talk to people who will talk to other people about how cool you were and and your yeah. talent. Impress a kid from Texas who will go on his <laughs> podcast and talk about how great ACH is because that's how I heard about him first and he's real good. I b- before you, I, I don't know how good I don't know how good Indie Mayhem shows success rate is yet, but we'll, we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 a whole it's a whole rich uh, rich tapestry. That's my answer. There you go. There you go. And from the chat, um, ah, somebody messaged and threw it off. Um, Matt Carlin says a standout package example, Ethan Page. He's recently in a match with uh, Gargano and Evolve. News of the relationship with WWE had just gone out. Page is going to lose the match, but he makes his mark. He uses Triple H's theme for his entrance. Big time trolling, but Page made sure people remembered him. That's a good point there. Uh, Garza says be an awesome wrestler plus travel. Don't just stay in the same local indie that books you plus have t-shirts at pro wrestling tees.com plus makes make fans uh talk about you make people hope that uh pwg or evolve want you and i think it's a little harder to get on pro wrestling tees if i'm not mistaken like you have to have about a, a two thousand followers a thousand followers something I like that i think it's 2500 right now 2500 and and i don't think any of us qualify for that the, uh, the shirt market is so oversaturated now that's true, um, That's true too. It's really, really difficult to, to break ground in right. that. If you can do it, great. But I think Pro Wrestling Tees is more of the spoils you can reap once you get that buzz rather than a way to attain it. 
Right, right. No, 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 no. That, that's serving an audience that you've already created. They, um, they yes. do have high quality shirts, though, sir. They do have high quality shirts, Especially including prowrestlingtees.com slash WMS, where you can get some good stuff like what Mad Mike's wearing there. I'm just saying uh, to our fans out there. <clears throat> <laughs> <clears throat> Um, but there you go. Uh, but it, so uh, no, yeah, and I think I think that's it. it, it it's a little bit of everything. I think I think the it, it boils down to uh, the wrestler realizing they need to put all those pieces together, right? Um, but to be fair, like it, it's not like every wrestler is ready for that, right? I mean, uh, you know, if you're three matches in, think about that stuff. But I don't. I think you need to make sure you're good in the ring before you start growing that out. It, it, would you the, agree the with problem that? is though there's a lot of guys that have been in this 10 years and don't right. take the steps to realize that it's a lot more than just what goes on in the ring and, right. and these are passionate guys and, and guys that legitimately want to do this for for a living um but but for whatever reason they they just they aren't putting all the pieces together and that's not to say that i have I, i'm still learning but i can also say that pretty much every major opportunity i've gotten is not because I was the most qualified person for the job. Mm -hmm. It was because I was out there and I was available and people knew of me and trusted me enough to give me an opportunity. Exactly. Exactly. And you can see all the ways that he's reaching out there at Joe Dombrowski.com. Tons of them. Cause you heard about him on wrestling mayhem show.com. Book Joe Dombrowski. Um, <laughs> All right, if you have any uh, comments on that, hashtag WMS Big Question uh, in this next week and let us know what you think uh, about that question. Okay, um, I, I, okay, I want to touch on something here real quick. We're kind of running low on time here on the recording. we got the Andy Mayhem show coming up where we're going to have uh, Nathan from... Uh, the, remember that RPG that we had sent to us a, a, a few weeks ago? Uh, the Worldwide Wrestling Role-Playing Game? We're going to be talking about, to him about that. Uh, but I want to get this in since we do have the lineup that we have. Derek Stroud uh, emailed us this week, and uh, he has a problem with the commentators on Raw. And maybe you guys, as, as people that have worked in the business on different levels, can kind of, uh, 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 you know, kind of kind of set this straight. Are you saying, what's up, Mayhem Show? He, he turns on Raw around... Uh, the, the turn... He turns on Raw, and, and there's more title changes. It's getting more predictable. The same note, he would like all of our opinions on this, and we've kind of more talked about that. Um, and uh, he's wondering if records really mean anything, and I think we're, we're pretty much, no, they don't, especially in WWE. Um, commentary talks about records and, 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 you know, makes you kind of act like, you know, makes you feel like you're stupid uh, as, as an audience member. Um well, this brings me to the next part. You know, is is he? He's wondering if uh, script, uh, commentary is scripted or 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 whatnot, because it sounds like they're just talking about uh, pointless drivel most of the time. It's really kind of uh, uh, getting annoying, and I think most of us kind of turn down and don't really pay attention to uh, commentary on our own sides. Um, one, I, I I think you guys can confirm, like commentary generally, even on the level of WWE, is not terribly scripted to that point, right? It, it, it's like not guided improv, isn't it? Well, yeah, it, it's not scripted, but there is a lot in a format that you need to uh, be aware of. Right. In terms that every single thing that happens on the show, you know, uh, uh, 30 seconds to sponsor plug, uh, uh, on camera in this, here's the on screen graphic Survivor Series is presented by Karate Fighters. Um, you need to plug. <laughs> <laughs> You need to plug Twitter. You need to plug social media. You need to plug uh, uh, breast cancer awareness, and you need to plug all these charities, and you need to plug how good of a dad Titus O'Neil is. You need and to plug Melissa all the stuff <laughs> that that is is are in their notes points that they need to hit. Yeah. Uh, uh, along with with whatever prep work they do, quotes, stats, uh, uh, what happened earlier in the night or last week, whatever. So there's there's a lot to jumble, um, and even in my toughest assignments probably cannot compare to Michael Cole doing one raw just because of how um, how in-depth everything is and how demanding it is mm -hmm. so I, I think it's easy to kind of lose some of that passion or lose a little bit of that focus or lose a little bit of that enthusiasm when you're doing three hours and 15 minutes every week um, I, I most problems in WWE today I think that's where it traces back to 
Um, I know Michael Cole is not everybody's cup of tea, um, but he does everything they want him to do uh, uh, as they want him to. So uh, uh, if it wasn't him, it'd be someone else doing the same thing. Um, as far as, as, as talking to the audience, like their uh, uh, intelligence is being insulted, that's another fine line. And I think they go overboard at some points, but at the same point, uh, we're always instructed to uh, treat it like your audience has never seen the show before. Right. That way, no one's getting lost. Everybody can jump in. Uh, people have busy lives. They may not remember what happened last week or, or, or last you know, Thursday night or, you know, even in segment one. Um, so you need to walk that fine line where everybody's along for the ride, but you're not spoon feeding them to where they feel like idiots. And that is a really tough line to, to juggle. And, and sometimes they do better than others. Um, plus what we, we don't have to work with on the Indies. Um, or at least I usually don't is uh somewhat obnoxiously screaming in our ear um i've 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 had that done but mostly just to yell at me to turn out lights but that's a whole other story <laughs> that sort will understand more than anybody yeah no, um, one. but i digress although there, uh, although there is somebody it, there is somebody that was helping me with a uh, sound uh last show and got scared when rhino uh, snuck up behind him uh so there's that too Brother, based on everything I read, uh, I read and uh, saw and heard about last show, nothing surprises me. <laughs> but be that as it may, um, yeah, I mean, uh, you have to you have to keep your focus and do your thing while someone is yelling at you to do this or to say that or to don't say this or don't say that or say this in a certain way, right? Um, and that affects things as well. I very, I don't know that I can think of one time I ever had anybody in my ear like that. Um, you know, to that extent, as opposed to just, you know, chirping in once or twice throughout the night, which is, which is easy. Um, so there's a lot of different factors going into it and it's a much, much tougher job than, than people expect or give it credit for. So mm -hmm. uh, listen, I know the announcers, uh, they're not, uh, Ross solely and Russell. It's not monsoon and Heenan. and it's not, uh, 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 you know, uh, breaking records and, and setting the world on fire, but it's, it's what the WWE wants. And, when when you sign with a certain team, you got to go by their playbook. So um, right. the mute button is your friend if you don't like it. But uh, uh, I'm a fan of Cole's professionalism and his journalistic approach. Mm -hmm. I'm a fan of the fact that JBL will just say whatever randomly pops into his head, um, including telling and he'll he'll usually him. try to put somebody over by comparing them to someone that the audience has no idea who they are. Um, like he made a Farmer Burns reference a couple weeks ago, who was a wrestler about 110 years ago. And I'm not exaggerating <laughs> wow. at all. He referenced Frank Gotch and Farmer Burns. Uh, he routinely references pop culture from like the 50s and 60s. Uh, uh, James Dean, John Wayne. Um, he always compared Paul London and Brian Kendrick to Sean and Steve Simpson. And I... <laughs> I barely know who Sean and Steve Simpson are <laughs> just barely enough to understand the reference, but also understand that that's not putting Paul and Brian over at all because <laughs> no one else gets the reference, but me, if anything, it puts Sean and Steve Simpson over. So if they want to make a nostalgia run, they can. Um, so, uh, you know, between learning and just picking out little nuggets of, of, uh, of um, entertainment when they haze Byron Sachs and I enjoy that too. Um, <laughs> You know, little stuff like that. Uh, but I guess the moral of the story is it, it's it's a really, really complicated job. And um, I've heard from announcers that have been there. You could have a flawless show, but you flub one line or do one thing that, that the powers that be don't want you to do. Um, you will get an earful when you get to the back. Jeez. So it's it, it it at times cannot be pleasant, but I, I believe they're doing the best they can. But it's 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 the WrestleMania, it's the top billing in that line, right? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that's 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 kind of kind of it's gonna be, you know. Uh, I think I think Joe really I mean, does sum it up when he says like you know they are they are doing what they are told to do, and and in a sense of if you don't like maybe the content of what they're saying or, or some of the things they're bringing up, which I think is what the it's like that's on what WWE wants them to portray. Um, 
I had the uh, the privilege of uh, picking the brain of, of someone recently that uh, is currently employed by the WWE, and that's the one biggest av- piece of advice that he told me is that no matter where you're working, you the the the, um, the way that you do commentary is what your boss wants it to be. The the style and the story that they want you to portray is what you need to portray on commentary. Um, and I think that's what WWE, that's what Michael Cole and all those guys are doing. They're they're um, you know, both, you know, pre, you know, before the show with notes and stuff like that, but also uh, with, you know, people in their ear telling them, uh, mention this or, or say this or, or whatever. Um, and and that, that's immensely tricky. I've, I've luckily never had the, uh, the opportunity to, to do anything along that line. And, and I can't even imagine how it would affect um, uh, my performance. So I, you, you have to take that into account, though. And we actually have a picture up here from from the chat room of uh, this is what the show notes look like, and they're they're full on scripts that they're taping to the table <laughs> at this point. That's crazy, uh, but yeah, that, that's what they get. They don't have a teleprompter. He's got to read that off. He's got to deal with that and and, and pull whatever spin on it that he can within that structure. So um, I don't know, LB Mike, do you have any thoughts on this before we uh, move on uh, from your side? Uh, well, as as the only person who's done commentary with Michael Cole. <laughs> at what a fan access right <laughs> yes absolutely at, at wrestlemania 19 fan access um and the only one on here that has been employed at one point by wwe yeah um separate instances uh but yeah like it's not it's not easy it, it, it really isn't like i know we give them a lot of guff mm-hmm. but you know i mean sometimes they deserve it sometimes they don't but I think if they, I think if WWE scaled back, like what the announcers had to say, we'd be more impressed with what the announcers did say. Right. Like because they, it's kind of like they're tr- like they're like they're working a match too, just trying to get their stuff in. You know, like <laughs> yeah. like like there's certain spots you have to hit. Like oh, you have to hit the ref bump. Yep, you gotta mention Twitter. You gotta hit the corner. You got. You gotta work in like Papa John's ads. You gotta like, you gotta do that spin spinny uh, flippy move off the top rope. Well, that's uh that's your weird that's hundred. That's Michael Cole saying vintage. Uh, that, like, yeah, that's vintage, or that's uh, JBL saying some <laughs> reference for a hundred ten year old wrestler. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's that's, I was gonna say, that's the line you use for the promo package. That's yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> there you go. It's almost brought it's to you almost, by Kickstart. Yeah, like, if you took out <laughs> <laughs> brought to you by Karate Fighters. Uh, but if, if you took out like some of the stuff, brought, because... brought to you by Stridex. I'm sorry, I'm just going through. <laughs> Side note: Can we can we mention how like uh, obviously comparing the two Survivor Series with tournaments, how we've gone from Karate Fighters to what like Roll Aids now as the sponsor? <laughs> no, 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 no. Let's bring that back around because I I brought up the Slammies from what 1987, also sponsored by Roll Aids. Really? Acid. Yeah. Kick acid, Sorg. Kick acid. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, and then the the 1994 edition that I, was on WWE I, Mania, all straight X. I bet that I bet that tagline for Rollades made more sense in the '88 Slammies than it does now. <laughs> Probably. Probably. I, I think. I think. Sorry, but I, going on ads in wrestling again. Um, I think the uh, the greatest one I've ever seen is the King of the Ring 1998, which like like they do the big like promo package where it's like Hell in the Cell with Taker and, and Mankind and. It was like First Blood with Austin and Kane, and then it just goes into Super Soaker. It brings you. <laughs> <laughs> Super Soaker of Blood. Uh, LB, LB, you're, you're, LB, you also have a, a very short uh, experience with commentating and wrestling. Uh, uh, what do you have, have any thoughts on this before we move on? Well, I, I, I want to say I miss Jim Ross freaking out about Skittles. That oh, was good. yes. Skittles, <laughs> Rainbow, um, Fruity. Ah, by God. There's people I, in yeah. there. Commentating is very hard. That's definitely true. And uh, especially when you don't know anything or anybody and you're just put in front of a mic and said, just go ahead, just talk. <laughs> it's very difficult. Yay, um, indie wrestling. Indie wrestling. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. It, it's definitely a lot of fun. And it, it did give me, you know, uh, uh, sympathy for the gentleman on, on uh, Raw and everything like that. But also, um, Talk about anything for three hours. Anything. Now talk about it and make sure you hit these key points, okay? And then talk about it while someone is shouting at you in an earpiece. We can simulate that on this podcast. 
We could. We should. <laughs> it would just end in all of us weeping. Because I have sponsor reads. Just People, weeping and you know what's... Yeah, exactly. Fruity, <laughs> delicious, delicious, fruity. <laughs> Um, but it's it's uh, you know it, it's very difficult and when done at a high level it's it's magnificent to see and I think the reason why we have such fatigue is for the for the you know commentary now on Raw giving them their due as hard as it is is because we've seen incredible commentary before with the Gorilla Monsoon and the and the Bobby the Brain Heenan and Jim Ross and everything like that we know how it can be done at a high level and it's not happening at that high level and so we get bored but i i also agree with joe when i say the mute button is your friend go ahead and hit it if it's pissing you off or google hangouts where you don't have to listen to commentary anyway you can just talk about with your friends that is correct because nothing they are saying is very important (laughs) at no point does michael cole say something that's ooh can't miss what michael cole said this week on raw at no point has michael cole said something more important in our debates about cereal in Google Hangouts. This is true. This is this is something that happens. All right, guys, on that point, let's find out what did you learn this week? Oh, and thank you. Thank you, Derek uh, Stroud, for, for uh, uh, submitting that, that, that email and getting us going on this. Um, so what did you learn from wrestling this week, Mike? Well, sort of, I learned that um, if, if Bray Wyatt is to succeed, he needs to turn the Undertaker into Erder Sterner and have him rest in peace. The Undertaker. <laughs> this is from our Looking for Group uh, outing, playing Black Ops 3 uh, the other day. Uh, go check out Boss Battle 169 for the story on that. Um, all right. Uh, LB, what did you learn from wrestling this week? I learned that uh, the WWE in general is no different from uh, any Cube Farm office. Uh, in that, you know, sometimes coworkers don't get along. Legitimately, nothing to do with their jobs, genuinely don't get along. And I think we saw that this week uh, on Twitter with um, uh, Paige and Lana. So you don't think that was a work? I don't. Mm. I don't. Mm. I think I think they might turn it into one, but I think it started as a genuine, like, we just don't get along kind of thing, you know? Okay. Mm-hmm. Eamon, what'd you learn from wrestling this week? Uh, I learned from wrestling this week that uh, motivation is everything. Uh, and I didn't know if we were going to uh, touch on this at all during the Survivor Series title tournament talk. But uh, I watched Raw, I've been obviously watching Raw the past few weeks. Man, Alberto Del Rio does not look like he wants to be there. <laughs> wow. He is just checked out. <laughs> is it just me? Like, I've, I've never seen, like, I don't know, like, I mean, at least, like, in a long time, like, that level of, like, he, like, he looks so angry all the time that he's there. I think, I think it's because he got stuck with Zeb. You like, think he, so? like, like, he took the big money back, and then he's I realizing... Think it's, I think it's the storyline in general. Well, yeah, but, well, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything against Zeb, but the, the storyline, like, mm-hmm. like, because he left for racial reasons, and now he's, like, Hey, guess what? You came back. You know what that means? We're cool again with everything. No one did anything wrong. And nope. <laughs> it's just it's just so weird, like like seeing impassioned like Del Rio on the gender ground and then like him transitioning back and you just immediately see the difference. Like it's it's like it's, watching it's James Storm in DNA compared to James Storm in NXT. Yeah, that's that as well. All right. Uh, uh, Joe Dombrowski, what did you learn from wrestling this week? I'll mention two things that uh, I learned from wrestling this week. One of them, not really so much that I learned, but was reinforced in me. That being that Nick Bockwinkle was the man. Mm-hmm. And it was really cool reading uh, on social media a lot of reflections and a lot of praise toward Bockwinkle's work because he goes under the radar a lot present mm-hmm. day because the the AWA legacy hasn't held up quite like uh, uh, NWA, WCW, et cetera. Um, but the class, the dignity, the presence uh, that Nick Bockwinkle carried himself with, uh, you know, Bockwinkle ironically was tried out as an announcer in WWF in 1987, and he wasn't very good, 
because he was so good at being a villain. He would talk down to his announce partners. He'd talk above the head of the viewers. But that's what made him so great. Nick Bockwinkle was a man of class, and he will be missed. Um, what I learned from pro wrestling this week is that pro wrestling fans on Twitter have completely forgotten how pro wrestling is supposed to work. <laughs> Last night, Melissa Joan Hart, the actress, <laughs> yes. tweeted that Kevin Owens is, quote, a lazy wrestler. <laughs> Kevin Owens got upset and responded and blocked her because that's what the Kevin Owens character would do. Kevin Owens fans were upset that Kevin <laughs> Owens, a heel, was called out for being a heel that does heel-like tendencies by a casual fan, admittedly, Melissa Joan Hart. Yet all of the Twitter sphere took it seriously and got up in arms as if Clarissa Darling is friggin' Dave Meltzer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. I want to read that PWI. <laughs> I want to read, like, Ferguson would be the number one heel. Sam would be the big baby face come back. Uh, we, can do a whole, we can do a whole episode in, on this. In, important update. I was just going to say, important update to that story as well. Kevin Owens has, has blocked Melissa Joan Hart, as well as all of the New Day has blocked her as well. <laughs> And, and they're villains. They're allowed to. If the New Day and Kevin Owens block Melissa Joan Hart, they're smart businessmen. That's how they would react. Uh, Kevin Owens is a coward uh, as a character. He should run from that battle. All of the fans that are up in arms magic. and uh, have blocked Melissa Joan Hart think they're the smartest guys in the room, but really they're just the biggest marks, which is not an insult, but somehow they'll take it as one. <laughs> and if they don't understand that, maybe they'll need Clarissa to explain how wrestling works. Na 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 na. Wow! <laughs> From the chat, Garza learned that Alberto Del Rio just remembered why he wanted to leave in the first place, and Mrs. Triple A. Matt Carlin's, uh, uh this is uh, what he's saying. Uh, Matt Carlin just assumes that Owen's kids are are being uh, total brats that night. So, show title, Clarissa Darling is Dave Mexer. So, there you go. Uh, from from the Facebook. Clarissa gave it five stars. <laughs> uh, Gran Azul is in there and speaks Spanish. Google Translate. He learned that El Rio is a monster for ripping off the mask of Kaliso. Absolutely oh, yeah, disgusting. That, Ooh. that got scary last night. I, I, thought, I thought he, I think he only went to like. Kind of tear at, but the whole thing almost just came off. Right, 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 right. Uh, Daniel learned that Vince McMahon must have gotten hurt by a Swiss Army knife at a young age because that's the only reason why Cesaro is buried. Yeah, that's an interesting. I thought. think Cesaro attacks Reigns at the pay per view. I think that'd it be good. I think that'd be real good. Um, from there, also, friends don't let friends post Lucha Underground spoilers. Uh, as an image that's been going around. I believe that's from our friends at Obsessed with Wrestling, power to the mm -hmm. Uh Alex learned that Matt Carlin's helped me learn that which underground fans are a truly different breed of wrestling fan. There you go. Uh, Jen Carlin's that Kevin Owens is uh, turning up the weirdest places to be interviewed and see more. <laughs> Melissa Joan Hart is, is a Dean Ambrose fangirl that needs to go away back to TV land where she belongs. Okay. Was that from Jen Carlin's? That was from Jen Carlin's, yeah. yeah. Jeez, Jen. <laughs> biggest Dean, our biggest Dean Ambrose fangirl calling out Dean Ambrose fangirl. It's a war. It's a, it's a whole, like, like it's just the giant internet cat fight. It's ridiculous. Um, no, no, Sorg, would that be a Salem the cat fight? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think we've had enough of... It's great. Uh, I see Sorg gazing at me through the monitor. And in person. All at you. All, it, in three it's, different it's directions. It's kind of like the judging matrix. <laughs> yeah. Um, I learned. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, where do I go from there? Um, I, I learned from wrestling this week, because I realized I didn't go yet, uh, that... Uh, that uh, uh, Deadly Games actually holds up really well. Mm -hmm. It does. I, I didn't even finish the show. I was on the last match, but it, it was really good. Intrigue of the night and a really good storyline. But so that's for Spoiler alert. The Rock turns heel. No! 
Whoa! Uh, some some commentary on that. Carlin's is actually going. He we went through. He's, he went through the deadly game, and he's been watching the Raws after the deadly game. <laughs> uh, and I guess he can't stop. He said he's 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 yeah, just completely he, into that he's era almost of at Raw. Half time heat then. He's a, he's coming up on half. He has to be. He has to go through capital punishment and uh, rock bottom. So capital carnage. Capital carnage. Was that it? Was yeah, that a real pay- capital, punishment, capital punishment is a government uh, thing. No, capital punishment that was, was the pay per view that took place in DC, and our truth was in the main event because he dressed as a Union soldier. No, that's no, like, a Confederate that's soldier. Capital that was that was that, that was one. capital punishment. That was capital the punishment. That was capital punishment. The only pay per view our truth main event by himself might have been a capital punishment in WCW, but we're not getting into that. Hey guys, WrestlingMayhemShow.com. Check out everything. <laughs> subscribe and tell us why we're wrong about uh, uh, our truth. And and Confederacy and Clarissa what? and Clarissa uh, explaining it all. Uh, please follow us on the Twitter. Follow us, uh, subscribe to us on the audio and video formats. And also, please drop us line four one two two zero six WMS zero. Good times at WrestlingMayhemShow dot com, where you can incite some conversation okay. or debate as well as uh, as Derek did. And we have a game we've been sitting on for like two weeks. I, I, we have to get to it next week from Garza uh, that we're going to do in this segment as well. Uh, please uh, uh, join us here live every Tuesday at live.wrestlingmayhemshow.com and uh, follow us on Twitter at Mayhem Show and Facebook in the Facebook group. Uh, and uh, thank you, the wife of the show, Missy, for doing the notes and, 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 and calling stuff out in the chat rooms all night long. Thank you so much. Late 1998 WWF is my jam. Who knew? Says Matt Carlins. Thank you so much, Joe Dombrowski, joe-dombrowski.com. Uh, and his voice is everywhere and can be on your project as well uh, through, through there. And uh, please go check out his stuff. And then The Legend of Virgil, Montreal Theory, and so much more. Finding Zach Gallen, oh, great, great projects. It's been a pleasure working with him. Uh, for the last several years and more to come. Anything, anything? I feel the love. All right. And also, uh, he's the proprietor of panelriot.com. Pop a lunchbox at DJ Lunchbox on the Twitter. It's true. Uh, we are hard at work on Panel Riot. 50, 50th episode. There will be no episode this week as I am still gathering threads, pulling it all together. But. Um, uh, while you wait, you will be soothed by uh, the full run of Jessica Jones coming out on Netflix. So go watch that, and by the time you finish that, there should be a new panel ride for you. There you go. And Eamon, at Eamon2, please, on the Twitter with InspireProWrestling.com. Yes, indeed. InspireProWrestling.com, our next event is a little while away on January 17th. Uh, it's, it's our Ecstasy of Goal 3 event, but we promised some very huge things that we'll hopefully – hopefully be able to announce soon so uh keep an eye out on all of our inspire pro social media and mad mike in the studio normally at poughkeepsie new york he uh well he, he does midweek ward and stuff around here I, I do and i i was absent on the midweek ward this week obviously because i was traveling but um we may slowly be beginning the countdown to saying goodbye to ring of honor uh, who knows? Well, sort of. If I can uh, find it. Yeah, sort of. We'll see where it goes. I may not be able to find it, sort of. To watch it. The I midweek can't. war may just turn into the NXT report. After well, a few we months have here. Impact, too. There you go. Lord knows yeah, it, the cockroach of professional wrestling. We have <laughs> Impact. <laughs> Well, there you go. Uh, and, and thank you, everybody, in the chat room live at SorgatronMedia.com, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, every Tuesday night. You can join us. Thank you so much. Everybody join us. It was a fun, fun night. Mayhem out. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Just wait. Wait for the perfect time to attack. Don't give up what you want. Take it back. Wait for the perfect time This show is a member of the Sorgatron Media Podcast Network. Find out more at SorgatronMedia.com.